Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Turkish Embassy. We are very pleased to host you today uh, on the occasion of the keynote lecture uh, that we will be uh, hearing from uh, Professor Jane McAuliffe. Um, uh, she's the Director of National and International Outreach of the uh, US um, uh, Library of Congress. And uh, today's event marks the beginning of a two-day symposium uh, on the form and, and functioning of the uh, Quranic manuscripts. Uh, the symposium, I think, is taking place uh, against the background of very intense and very fruitful cooperation uh, between our embassy uh, and the, uh, the Smithsonian Institution, uh, and first and foremost, uh, the Free and Secular Galleries, uh, which is uh, headed by um, a good friend of the Turkish Embassy, Mr. Julian Rabi. Um, and last October, uh, I'm sure you all know, uh, Mr. Rabi, uh, in collaboration with the Turkish, uh, Museum, uh, Turkish and Islamic Museum uh, of Arts in Istanbul, uh, whose director, by the way, uh, is uh, in our midst, uh, Mr. Sarajettin uh, Shahin, uh, joining us today. Um, they opened the first uh, major exhibition uh, of uh, our Holy Book Quran in the United States. Uh, the exhibition is called The Art of Quran uh, and will remain open until February 2017. Uh, those of you who haven't uh, yet seen uh, the exhibition, I strongly encourage you to, to go and see it. Uh, and, and indeed, uh, admiring those uh, priceless uh, manuscripts uh, dating back to uh, the 8th century, 9th century, uh, back all the way to, to the 17th century, uh, I said to myself, uh, the creator of these uh, fabulous, magnificent arts of work uh, cannot possibly have anything in common uh, with, uh, with a terrorist, uh, a barbaric terrorist organization, uh, which, uh, among many other atrocities uh, that it perpetrates, uh, deliberately destroys uh, cultural sites and uh, plunders, loots uh, cult cultural artifacts. Uh, it calls itself the Islamic State, but uh, we know that terrorism has no religion, and uh, for this reason, uh, we prefer to use another acronym, uh, Daesh, you may have heard, which contains no reference to Islam, uh, instead of uh, some of the more commonly used acronyms like ISIS or, or ISIL. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, today's uh, keynote speaker, uh, Professor um, McAuliffe, is uh, one of the most prominent scholars uh, specialized in uh, Islamic studies. She has an impressive bio, um, and uh, which I think uh, Mr. Rabbi will uh, briefly um, uh, highlight uh, momentarily. Uh, but um, uh, in addition to her extensive academic work on Islam uh, and its uh, and Quran, uh, Professor McCullough has spent a lot of time um, working to foster dialogue, uh, collaboration, cultural uh, uh, enhancement, mutual cultural uh, experiences. Uh, promote mutual understanding among uh, uh, people belonging to, belonging to different faith groups. Uh, and um, uh, at a time when our uh, entire world is ridden with um, uh, not only uh, terrorism uh, and religious extremism, but also xenophobia uh, and racism, uh, I think the need for such uh, intercultural, uh, interreligious exchanges cannot be overemphasized. Uh, and um, uh, identifying commonalities uh, and shared values uh, while uh, embracing and indeed treasuring diversity uh, and uh, celebrating those differences, um, I believe, is an urgent necessity. And I'm confident that uh, the symposium that, we, that uh, will be starting today uh, will make an important contribution uh, to that uh, end. Uh, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Julian Rabi. Uh, director of the Smithsonian uh, Free and Sector Galleries for his introduction of our keynote speaker. And uh, our event will be followed by a reception. So please uh, stay and uh, uh, join us. Uh, it will be a great social event. Thank you so much for your attention. Ismail, thank, thank you very, very much indeed. Um, we owe an enormous thanks to everybody at the uh, embassy here not just for this evening, but for uh, unwavering support over the last, actually, remarkably six years since we first planned this exhibition. As you can imagine, over the last six months, it's been a difficult time to arrange an exhibition like this. And really, with the help of the embassy, with the extraordinary support of 
Sirajuddin Shaheen, who is the director of the Turkish and Islamic Arts Museum, and with the support of the Ministry of Culture, uh, this exhibition has taken place. And I really want to emphasize what Ismail said just a moment ago. Don't let's pull any punches. This is a very, very difficult time in the world. The world is fractured. There's a sense of almost universal despair. And I think for many Muslims in this country, it must be a time of worry. So we're, in a way, thrilled that it took us six years and we were able to open this exhibition at a time which seems not only important in, t in this moment for the world, but particularly in the light of the um, events over the whole election in the last year. When I think that the uh, Muslim community has uh, been particularly berated. And so we're happy not only to celebrate, as you said, those differences, but also to kind of ensure that the Smithsonian is a place where um, America and Asia meet. So we're thrilled about this uh, exhibition and particularly proud that tonight one of the um, main advisors for this exhibition and a principal contributors, Jane McAuliffe, is going to uh, give the keynote um, address. Jane has been part of this project right from the outset. She's helped shape the exhibition and shape uh, the thinking. Her biography is absolutely um, extraordinary and I'm just going to make a few selections. She is currently the inaugural director of national and international outreach at the Library of Congress. Previously, she was director of the Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. She was also the eighth president of Bryn Mawr College. She's been dean of arts and sciences at Georgetown University. And her specialization appropriately for this exhibition is on Islam and the Quran. In 1991, she wrote Quranic Christians. In 1995, Abbasid authority affirmed. In 2002, with reverence for the word. And in 2006, he was the editor of the six volume encyclopedia of the Quran. She's also the editor of the Cambridge Companion to the Quran, the Norton Anthology of World Religions, a section on Islam, and the Quran, a Norton critical edition that came out this year. She's past president of the American Academy of Religion, a member of the American Philosophical Society, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and also serves on the Council on Foreign Relations. We could not have a more illustrious speaker. So, Jane, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for that very generous introduction. Um, I'm going to do something tonight that I've never done before, which is I'd like to dedicate this lecture to a very dear colleague, one of the most eminent scholars in Islamic studies, who died on Tuesday night. Uh, Professor Andrew Rippon of the University of Victoria in British Columbia. Um, all of us today have been mourning him, and um, I, these words I would like to say as a tribute to him. I'd also like to begin with two comments. I am really very grateful to and very proud of the Smithsonian for their decision to mount the wonderful exhibit on the art of the Quran. Smithsonian leadership 
is not unaware, obviously, as you've heard tonight, of the potential for controversy in this very troubled time. And yet they chose to proceed with this landmark effort. I'd also like to say that I'm honored to be asked to give the keynote for this conference. The papers tomorrow will be by world specialists in the study of Islamic manuscripts. And I, it, I'm really thrilled that so many eminent scholars have gathered to enhance our understanding of this exhibit and to mark its presentation in this nation's capital. But I hope I will be forgiven for not addressing this lecture to my scholarly colleagues. As I began to think about my remarks this evening, the audience that kept coming to mind is all the people who have seen the exhibit or who, who will see it in the months to come. People who may have heard something about the Quran, but probably have not had an opportunity to learn much about it. Now, I know that all of my colleagues in Islamic studies have over the years been very generous in lecturing to general audiences, introducing people to Islam and to the Quran. Over the decades that I have done this and have given lectures, especially about the Quran, I have found that the questions that follow the lecture often cluster around a similar set of topics. So I thought, well, why not start there? I'd like to address three of those tonight. And I'm going to try and coordinate this. Oh, I have to put it on. Helped. Thank you very much. All right, so let's start with the questions. First question, is there a connection between the Quran and the Bible? America has long been a Bible-saturated society, and I have a rather interesting proof point for that assertion. For the last decade, the Library of Congress has been digitizing America's historic newspapers those that range from 1789 to 1922. The project website, which is called Chronicling America, now contains over 11 million pages of newsprint from 150,000 individual newspapers. That's everything from big city newspapers to small town ones. Last year, the National Endowment for the Humanities mounted a digital humanities competition. And the prize winner of that competition took it upon himself to data mine the Chronicling America website, looking for biblical quotations in all of these 150,000 newspapers. He came up with 866,000 quotations from the Bible in America's newspapers. So it's not going to be surprising if a number of people who go to the exhibit are wondering about the connection between the Bible and the Quran. There are lots of different ways to talk about this, and I'll be illustrating my remarks tonight with some illustrations from the exhibit as well as other sources. Here's the first one. One of the things one way in which you could talk about the connection between the Bible and the Quran is to look at the characters that are common to both of these scriptural, scriptural um, texts. And so let's look at the mention of two biblical figures, one from the Hebrew Bible and one from the New Testament. This slide refers to Moses. It's from the 17th surah. We gave to Moses nine signs. In Quranic commentary, tafsir, these are usually listed as floods, locusts, vermin, frogs, blood, the staff of Moses, the hand of Moses, destruction, and the sea. There is some, therefore, but not complete overlap between these nine signs and the ten plagues of uh, the biblical book of Exodus. The next sign, in the next slide, mentions Zechariah, a figure from the New Testament, the father of John the Baptist, and relates Zechariah's prayer 
for a son, giving us some sense of the text to be found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 5 to 25. Scholars have found echoes of the Quran in the vast corpus of extant Near Eastern literature, apocryphal gospels, Syriac liturgical texts, rabbinical exegesis, but far and away the largest repository of such narrative intersections is the Bible. Both of these scriptural repositories talk about God's creation of the world and of Adam and Eve, the flood and Noah and the ark, God's covenant with Abraham and his descendants. They both mention Mary and Jesus. And here we have a lovely Indian miniature of Mary and Jesus on the left. On the right is a depiction of Moses. Moses is a particularly important model, often referred to in the Quran, as a, even as a prefiguration of Muhammad. This depiction is of Moses and the magicians of Pharaoh. And in fact, this illustration is from a wonderful volume by the curator of the Art of the Quran exhibit, Masume Farhad, whom I'm I know is here somewhere in our audience and who was gracious enough to let me use this illustration. The next slide, which is really one of the most beautiful Qur'ans in the exhibit, <clears throat> recounts another Moses story, this one from the 18th surah of the Qur'an. It's the story of Moses and the mysterious servant of God, who's traditionally called Khidr al Khadr. And I have to thank, thank Simon Rettig for fixing this slide. I sent him my slides a couple of days ago, and he did wonderful things to, him, to them, including this particular one. Thank you, Simon. Um, this servant of God figure tests the patience of Moses by performing a series of seemingly inexplicable acts after making Moses promise that he will not question Hitler's actions. The narrative covers more than 20 verses in, uh, in the 18th surah. So there are lots of common characters that flow between the Bible and the Quran, and that's one way of looking at the connection. The figures range from Adam, as we said, through Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and beyond. And there are also many familiar teachings, heaven and hell and divine judgment, a God of might and of mercy, a moral system that fosters integrity and social justice. But Muslim theologians themselves also thought a lot about the Quran's connection to earlier monotheistic scriptures. They asked themselves, if they are all divine revelation, how do they relate to each other? And they came up with a doctrine of what I would call both confirmation and supersession. First of all, the Qur'an is the final revelation confirming all earlier revelations, as this passage from the third surah indicates. And this from Surah 12. In this, in many ways, the Qur'an mimics the Christian attitude to Jewish scriptures, as reflected, for example, in the titles Old Testament and New Testament. The Quran, as God's final revelation to God's final prophet, surpasses the Torah, the Torah, and the Injil, the Gospel, but acknowledges the place of those earlier scriptures in what might, might be called salvation history. Based on some key Quranic verses, however, Islam also teaches that earlier revelations suffered distortion, decay, and deliberate misinterpretation. This is known as the doctrine of tahrif. Consequently, the texts that we currently designate as Torah and Gospel differ in the minds of Muslim theologians significantly from their divinely bestowed original, originals. Inconsistencies between the Quran and earlier scriptures are due to these distortions and deviations that have crept into the earlier scriptures. 
An example of this would be the next slide, which the Quranic verse in Surah 18 that talks about the Christian belief in Jesus as the Son of God. Clearly, according to Quranic theology, this could not have been part of the original revelation that God gave in the, in this case, in the Injil, but is a later distortion. To sum up then, there is a theological acknowledgement of continuity between the Quran and earlier scriptures, but also a clear recognition of difference, a sense that Islam is very much a new and separate religion. And one of the most famous passages that signals that in the Quran is this from one of the final surahs, Surah 109. O disbeliever, I do not worship what you worship, nor do you worship what I worship, etc. A third way in which the Quran and the Bible are connected can be found in the many ways in which Muslims have studied the Bible and in which non-Muslims have studied the Quran. There is a whole field of what I would call Muslim biblical scholarship. Medieval Muslim scholars actively searched the Jewish and Christian scriptures for verses that they could interpret as predictions of the coming of Muhammad and of his community. And there's actually a Quranic warrant for such searching in verses like Surah 7, verse 157, in which God responds to the plea of Moses, who begs God's forgiveness for his people in the aftermath of the golden calf episode. And God then promises, and I quote now, to, to bless those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet, whom they find written with him in the Torah and the Gospel. Another passage in the Quran to which this kind of um, Muslim biblical scholarship is linked is from the 61st surah, where it says, when Jesus, son of Mary, said, O children of Israel, I am the messenger of God to you, the one who confirms the Torah, Torah, which is before me, and the one who announces a messenger who comes after me, whose name is Ahmed, more praiseworthy. Then a group of biblical passages became the standard references in this line of Muslim scholarship. Things like Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18. I will raise up for them a prophet like you, Moses, from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything that I command. Or Matthew chapter 21, verse 43. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruit of the kingdom. This was often interpreted by Muslim biblical scholars as a, predict as a prediction of the triumph of Islam. So you have Muslim biblical scholarship on the one hand, and then you have Western scholarship on the Quran on the other hand. I think all of us know that in, in the post-Enlightenment period, biblical scholarship adopted methodologies of textual and historical criticism. And European scholarship, the European studies of the Quran, especially in Germany, quickly followed suit. In 1833, a German rabbi, Abraham Geiger, published a book entitled, What Has Muhammad Borrowed from Judaism? A book in which he sought to identify biblical and post-biblical traditions in the Quran. Several subsequent generations of research situated the Quran then within the larger world of late antiquity and its textual traditions, both Jewish and Christian. By the mid 20th century, however, people began to view efforts like this to trace the Jewish and or Christian background of the Quran as covert or not so covert forms of religious triumphalism. It was more fully realized that Muslims viewed such investigations as blasphemous rejections 
of the divine origin of the Qur'an. There has been a recent reemergence of a kind of Christian influence scholarship, which looks at supposed Qur'anic subtexts that can be found in earlier Syriac sources. So scholarship on the Qur'an continues to be interested in these investigations about the relationship between the Bible and the Qur'an. Now I'd like to turn to the second of the three questions I'll talk about tonight, um, which is not very elegantly phrased, but I think you'll understand the import of it as I continue. Why does the Qur'an matter so much to Muslims? <clears throat> In the last dozen years, we've heard about acts or allegations of desecration of the Quran at the US detention center in Guantanamo, at a church in Gainesville, Florida, and in places like Nigeria, Afghanistan, and Bangladesh. In the protests that followed the news of these events, riots erupted and people were killed. Many non-Muslims, while sickened by the blasphemies and desecrations, nevertheless have had trouble understanding the intensity of these incidents. An explanation for this intensity could begin with a description of how central the Quran is to Muslim life and thought. First of all, it's understood to be, oops, Am I going back? No. Sorry. OK. It's understood to be God's greatest gift to humankind. And the next, this and the following two slides will point to Quranic citations of this. This, uh, from Surah 96, these verses are often considered to be the first ones revealed to the prophet. Recite in the name of your Lord, who created, created man from a clot. Recite, and your Lord is the most bounteous, who teaches by the pen. From Surah 7, this Quran is insight from your Lord, and a guidance, and a mercy. From the beautiful 55th Surah, the Beneficent that being God. He has made known the Quran. He has created man. These are God's great, great gifts. So the Quran is a, a blessing, a guidance for humans. Immersion in the Quran also begins at a very young age. And in order for me to say a little bit about this, I first need to say a word about the structure of the Quran. It is, I think, as many of you know, comprised of 114 surahs, or chapters, and each surah, in turn, is composed of verses, ayat. Some are very short, some are quite lengthy. The cadence and closing syllables of many ayat create rhythmic prose patterns that lend great power and beauty to the text. In the very early period, the Quran was divided into portions or recitational sequences. So it's, and this is reflected in the exhibit. It's reflected, it's um, divided into seven roughly equal parts so that it can be recited over the course of, re of a week, one part each day. It's divided into 30ths, again, so a, part, a portion could be recited each day of the month, particularly the month of Ramadan, or into 60ths so that it could be recited twice a day during a month, again, Ramadan. Children as young as four or five begin learning the shortest phrases and verses, as indicated by these Quran classes in Nigeria and Mali. And they learn those verses in Arabic. Arabic is, of course, not the native tongue of most Muslims, and even those who speak Arabic do not speak Quranic Arabic. And soon these children embark upon the recitation and memorization of short surahs. For the most dedicated among them, there follows the patient, slow, patient progression of learning the entire Quran by heart and even learning to recite it 
in um, contest situations. Perhaps even eventually to become a, res a professional reciter of the Quran. So children are formed from a very early age in the Quran itself and in their ability to reproduce the beauty and the sounds of the Quran. Another way of thinking about this is to realize that the Quran is from Muslims what I would call a whole body experience. The mouth, let's start with the mouth. An observant Muslim recites the first surah and other verses of the Quran during each of the five daily prayers. During the month of Ramadan, as I just said, many Muslims read or recite one thirtieth of the Quran each day. And there is special recitation towards the end of Ramadan during what is known as Laylatul Qadr, the night of power, which commemorates the first stage of the revelation of the Quran. So the lips are continually forming Quranic words. The ears, the ears continually hear the sounds and rhythms of the Quran. Certainly during the prayers, of course, but also the professional recitation that marks so many major events in the lives of Muslims. And in this electronic age, exposure to Quranic recitation has exploded across the Muslim world. Television channels broadcast the best reciters 24 hours a day. First cassettes and then CDs and now smartphones make it possible to listen to the Quran anywhere at any time. The discipline known as the science of recitation, ilm tajweed, requires years of study and practice, learning particular pronunciations, prolongations and pauses, multiple accepted readings, idiosyncratic spellings of some Quranic words. And one traditionally learned this from a skilled practitioner. It was a, an apprentice model of learning. Now there are count, countless online tutorials and apps by which one can self-teach this discipline of Quranic recitation. So, mouth, ears, the hands. The 80th surah of the Quran speaks of the Quran as being on honored leaves, exalted, purified. Hands must be ritually pure in order to touch, read, or recite the Quran. There are, of course, various physical functions that render a person impure and that require purification either through full or partial ablutions. The sense of sacredness extends to the treatment of the text. The Quran is never placed on the ground or in any proximity to dirt or dust. Nothing is set on top of it. I had a quick lesson in this some years ago when I was auditing a class at the University of, George, of Jordan in Quranic exegesis, and I had a copy of the Quran open on my uh, lap, and I picked up a notebook to take a note on something that the professor was saying and set it on top of the Quran, and the woman sitting next to me went like this, and I quickly realized you know, that I had made an, uh, a serious error there. In Muslim homes, the Quran is often placed on a beautifully decorated bookstand. The eyes, the eyes find Quranic passages on objects both exalted and mundane. Monumental inscriptions decorate public buildings large and small, continually pulling the eye to the divine word. The dome of the rock on the right there in Jerusalem, dated to 691, carries about 250 meters of inscriptions. The golden letters inscribe the Besmala and, a, and the profession of faith, as well as various other citations from the texts. Verses can be found on early coinage and on decorative and functional objects, such as this mosque lamp, the left side of the slide. It can be found in epitaphs, on tombstones and other funerary structures, like the great Mughal mausoleums, such as, as the Taj Mahal in Agra. And then, of course, there are the countless beautiful manuscripts that have been created, 
Surah 39 speaks about God has now revealed the fairest of statements and generations and generations of artists have taken that and created copies of the Quran that are just stunning in their beauty as the exhibit that we have with us in these months demonstrates. This combination, I think, of visual and oral immersion infuses Muslim public and private spaces with the blessing, the barakah, of God's word. It's a full immersion experience. The final matter that I'll address is not so much a question as an assumption. The assumption that the Quran really doesn't have anything to do with America. Yes, while it's undoubtedly important to our Muslim citizens, the Quran's presence in this country is relatively recent, isn't it? Well, not so fast. Many Muslims came to this country in the slave ships from West Africa. While there are no reliable statistics, scholars estimate that the number of African Muslims and their descendants who lived in colonial and antebellum America is likely in the tens of thousands. And white colonial, white colonial Americans were aware that there were Muslims among the slave populations. They often associated them with Shakespeare's Othello, the Moor, or called them Mohammedans. I'd like to talk about or introduce you to three of these figures for whom we have historical accounts. The first is Job ben Solomon, or to use his Arabic name, Ayyub bin Suleiman. He was born in 1702 and died in 1773 on the eve of the American Revolution. Job came from the major Fulbe clan of Jalo in Bundu, the easternmost region of present-day Senegal. Job was taken captive on a trading mission into enemy Mandingo territory, and he was put on a slave ship to Annapolis, the same journey, by the way, made in 1750 by Kunta Kinta, Alex Haley's ancestor and roots. He was sold to a Mr. Tolsey in Kent Island, Maryland, but eventually escaped to southern Pennsylvania, where, however, he was caught and imprisoned. James Oglethorpe, the founder of the Georgia colony, set a bond for Job, and in 1733, Job and Thomas Blewett, a British judge in Annapolis, sailed to England. On the voyage, Job wrote out the Quran from memory, and Blewett taught him English. Thomas Blewett eventually wrote Job's memoir, the first biography of a sub-Saharan African in a European language, and this is the title of the memoir. Some, memoir, some memoirs of the life of Job, the son of Solomon, the high priest of Bundu in Africa, who was a slave about two years in Maryland and afterwards being brought to England, was set free and sent to his native land in 1734. Job's literacy in Quranic Arabic allowed him to assist George Sale in the latter's translation of the Quran, and I'll say more about George Sale's translation in a few moments. Job also worked with a man named Hans Sloan, who at his death in 1753 bequeathed, this is Sloan now, bequeathed all his books, prints, drawings, coins, and other items to the nation, and these formed the nucleus of the British Museum, which opened to the public in 1759. In 2013, the Quran that Job had written from memory surfaced as lot number 137 at Bonhams, a London-based auction house. It was acquired by a private collector for just over $25,000. The second of these individuals is Yaro Mahmoud. Yaro was born in 1736 and died in 1823. He, too, was born in West Africa 
and in 1752 made a slave crossing to America on the Elijah, but we don't know the circumstances of his capture. Yarrow Mammut was owned for 44 years by the Beale family of Maryland. He worked as a body servant and traveled with his owner, a tobacco farmer. Yarrow was freed in 1796 and he moved to Georgetown and became a financier for local merchants, both black and white. He bought a house in Georgetown, what is now 30, 3324 Dent Place in 1800. Uh, that house was destroyed, and, and, and uh, two or three later houses, the last of which was hit by a tree in 2012 during Hurricane Irene. The, that lot, however, was recently the site of a DC archaeological office dig. Part of Yarrow's renown is due to the fact that he was painted, these two portraits. He was painted in 1819 by Charles Wilson Peel who also painted Washington, Franklin, and Hamilton. Peel also wrote Mahmoud's obituary and noted that he was interred in his garden, the spot where he usually resorted to pray. That portrait, the one on the left, hangs in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. He was painted in 1823 by James Alexander Simpson, later an art professor at Georgetown University. And that portrait on the right ordinarily hangs in the Georgetown Public Library, but it is currently on a three-year loan to the Smithsonian. And just a few years ago, a local, a local lawyer, James Johnston, wrote a book about Yarrow Mahmoud and his descendants entitled, From Slave Ship to Harvard, Yarrow Mahmoud and the History of an African American Family. The third of these is Omar ibn Said born in 1770 and died in 1864. Like Job ben Solomon, he was a fulba, fulbe from the Fututoro area of northern Sen Senegal. Omar ibn Said was enslaved during a military conflict and transported to the Carolinas around 1807. Twenty years later, his final master, James Owens of Fayetteville, North Carolina, asked him to write about his capture, deportation, and treatment at the hands of earlier owners. <clears throat> Ibn Said's manuscript begins with a citation from the 67th surah, Surah al-Mulk. It was written in Arabic, clear evidence of his education and former status as a scholar. Translations in English soon followed, and their broad dissemination increased Ibn Said's popularity and renown. The manuscript itself, which was long thought to be lost, was rediscovered about 20 years ago in Alexandria, Virginia. And today, the mosque in Fayetteville, North Carolina, is named after Omar Ibn Said. So the Quran came very early to this country in the minds and in the hearts of Muslim slaves. Another way in which the Quran has been present in this country is the fascination that it held for a number of American authors like Irving, Emerson, and Poe. Washington Irving, who was born in 1783, moved in 1826 to Spain. While there, he explored the Alhambra in Granada, and this inspired his book, Tales of the Alhambra, a series of tales and sketches of the Moors and Spaniards. And he also began collecting information on Islam's founder for what would later become his book, Muhammad and his successors. Irving wanted to introduce Muhammad to the American public as a major historical figure. And in the preface to its 1850 publication, Irving said this, that he wanted to, di to digest into an easy, perspicuous, and flowing narrative the admitted, fa the admitted facts concerning Muhammad, together with such legends and traditions as, it, as have been wrought into the whole system of Oriental literature, and at the same time to give such a summary of his faith as might be sufficient for
for the more general reader. Ralph Waldo Emerson, on the right of this slide, born in 1803, bought a copy of the Quran at a London bookstore on his first trip abroad in 1833. He left a note of this purchase in his diary. And some of his early essays featured epigrams attributed to the Quran and the Hadith. And this practice of citation from the Quran became more pronounced in some of his later writings on spiritual and esoteric topics. Finally, Edgar Allan Poe, born in 1809, takes the theme of his second collection of verse from the seventh surah of the Quran, El Araf, the heights, i.e. the space between heaven and hell. This collection was known as El Araf, Tamerlane, and Minor Poems. He attributed the angelic title character in a later poem, Israfel, published in 1831, to the Quran, mistakenly as it turns out. The name of this angel and the description of his having the most melodious voice of all God's creatures actually comes from the introductory passage, the so-called preliminary discourse that, with which George Sale prefaced his translation of the Quran. And the final way in which the Quran has become part of the fabric of, Mer of American life is the fact that it was read by our founding fathers. In the Boston Public Library, the book known as Adams 281.1 is a copy of the Quran from the personal library of John Adams. It's one of a collection of 2,400 books that belong to the second president and reports, but reports of the Quran in American libraries go back much earlier than that, even to as early as 1683, when an early settler of Germantown, Pennsylvania, brought a German version to these shores. Adam's Quran was the first published in the United States, printed in Springfield in 1806. That Adams owned a Quran translation is an indication of the early of the early toleration he extended to non-Christian religions, including Islam. And evidence of this toleration may be found in the 1780 Massachusetts Constitution, which John L. Adams helped to create, and which was one of the models for the US Constitution. In the words of another of its drafters, this Massachusetts con Constitution was designed to ensure, I quote, the most ample of liberty of conscience to deists, Mohammedans, Jews, and Christians. And Thomas Jefferson, there to the left. His personal library, of course, became the core collection of the Library of Congress. And among Jefferson's acquisitions, now on permanent display at the Library of Congress, is a translation of the Quran done by the English scholar George Sale. Jefferson bought this while studying law as a young man in Williamsburg, Virginia. And Sale's translation is, of course, that one with which Job Ben Solomon assisted. As I said a moment ago, Sale prefaced his translation with what he called a preliminary discourse, a lengthy explanation of Islamic thought and practice. So one can assume that America's third president was not unfamiliar with Islam's tenets. Jefferson wrote his bill for establishing religious freedom to protect, I quote, the Jew and the Gentile, the Christian and the Mohammedan, the Hindu and the infidel of every denomination. On January 4th, 2007, Jefferson's Quran became the center of a controversy when the first Muslim ever elected to Congress, Representative Keith Ellison, a Democrat from Minnesota, asked to place his hand on it while taking his oath of office. So I've ended with a mention of controversy, just as I began with an expression of gratitude to the Freer Sackler for being willing to risk the possible controversy with this, that this marvelous exhibit might attract. 
I hope that these thoughts about some of the questions that visitors may bring with them to the exhibition can serve as a, as a fitting prelude to tomorrow's splendid lineup of papers about the glories of Quranic manuscripts. You'll be in for a treat tomorrow. Thank you very much. <laughs>